Okay, now. Now we're really. Now we're really for fucking business. Okay, hey guys, it's me, Darlene, your host. Um, back for another episode of Lee Do You Remember This, a podcast about Hollywood's best worst decade, the early 2000s. And this is, I would say, no less than the fourth time <laughs> we have started this episode. The fourth time, best time. Yes, queen. Um, so. I am here with an illustrious guest. Full of luster. Full of, that's what that means. That's the etymology. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Maddie Turner. Turner, Turner. And I do demand that everyone says my name with a British accent. Maddie Turner. Maddie, um, you are a filmmaker. Kind of. A visionary. Yes. Um, 2020. 2020. 2020 vision. 2020 visionary. Yes, of course. Don't get it twisted. Never would, never would try to. Thank never you. would do that to you. I appreciate that. Um, Maddie has some glorious uh, short films on TikTok. Um, you know, what? <laughs> I mean, where are you? Oh, you're where, able to see this? Where are you getting this information? <laughs> Yes, like, is she just, like, lip-syncing that Mika song yeah. um, and just, like, spelling out her trauma on the screen? Like, yeah. yeah, and it's, like, really innovative. Yeah. Just kidding. She does not do that. <laughs> no, I, no, that's exactly what I do. I, um, I specialize in, like, slowed-down, reverbed versions of um, 1950s, Duop ballads, mm, mm-hmm. right? Gyrate on the screen. She is known for that, famously. Yeah, famously known for that, and famously will die doing that. Yeah. Now I will say this: um, the first time we started this podcast, we discussed how we had a false start, and I said, "You know what?" As a wise podcasting man once told me, Troy McKeady, whatever you have to, when you have to re-record, the second one always ends up better. This is not the third time. This is the third to fourth time. And I will say, this is still incredibly manic. And um, yet it is <laughs> 10 steps down from what it was. I do think that there is a special type of mania that does happen whenever you and I look each other in the eyes it's, and begin to speak. It is it's something people should be scared and excited about. Yeah, like I don't like would would you call us in an emergency? No. No. No, 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 no. Now I, I will say this. I do think you could call us individually. Oh, two hundred percent. Collectively? No. No, 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 no. We are only available for birthday parties, bar mitzvahs, mm-hmm. and funerals. And funerals. We can bring a smile to your face. We will do that in a second. Now, if you need to bury a body, I'll tell you this. You call me, I'm good to go. She's got the tarp. She's got the the handsaw. I also have the alibi. I I like know what we're where we're going and where we've come. Uncle like owns the docks. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) My uncle is the docks. I mean, my father is the sea. Famously. Famous. No, no. Fam- we, famous. we know that. We, we know, know that. that. Now, you, now let's say you call me on a Friday night. You've killed someone. Yeah. How, Dara, I need you. Yes. And let's say you have the unfortunate incident that I am hanging out with Maddie. Ooh. Ooh. I don't know if that is going to work out for you. Now, will we be on the docks? Like singing, wrapping up a body in a tarp. Will we, yeah. I mean, like, will we find some way to turn this into a theatrical experience? Oh, you know what would happen, unfortunately? It would it would be a big weekend at Bernie's situation. Oh, oh, no, I mean, like, that goes without saying. That goes without saying. So today, we will be recapping 
I can't remember Wait, what episode it was. It's called Aquarium. It's, it's called something Aquarium. It's called the Age of Aquarium. Age of Aquarium. Which I will say, I think they do a great job naming the episodes of this show. Personally, they there's a lot of fun play on words. I think an intern did a great job. But so we we watched Age of Aquarium. Um, Where is Holly from? Holly, well, we've she, talked about this before, but I do need a reminder. Okay, so she is from Alaska and Oregon. Her accent is so interesting. Well, if you were to listen to her audiobook, and I highly recommend listen. I read the book and then I got the audiobook. You self narrated. Know, self narrated. And it's really fun. She does the voices, and you also are treated to the fact that she pronounces W's with a H, <laughs> like quite. And you never realize like how many W words there are until you know encounter why. that. <laughs> why? Why? I just think, like there is something that is. It, it does feel almost like a New England accent that yes. she's doing, and I. It's from a completely different part of the country, almost like the opposite side in many ways. Oh, I would say Oregon is quite it, firmly on the other side. Firmly of planted the United it. States. Yeah, I would say if there's the most opposite state to New Hampshire would be Oregon. Would be Oregon, and somehow. Or I'd, I'd grant you a Washington. I'd grant you that. <laughs> but it is, I think it might be, we're thinking too much about coasts and not enough, enough about, about Canada. The Canada of it all. We're not thinking about the Canada of it all. And that is really... This is Canada erasure at its finest. And I think that is the problem with the world. We're really never thinking about Canada the mm -hmm. way that we should be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I will say, please... If you have the opportunity, listen to the audiobook and like really luxuriate and that into those why those who what when where why. Well, I do think that's really interesting. Is the episode that we watched prior that we don't speak about mm -hmm. was a Holly focused episode. It was her birthday. Yes. The and Marie Antoinette one, episode. This one is her five-year anniversary. Yes. Can I just say, I was floored by the fact that she had been with him for five years. I don't know why, but that to me is like a really long time. And I was impressed in a way that I wasn't expecting to be. Really? I was like, oh. Say more. I was like, okay, Five years, that's that's a pretty significant chunk of time. Especially at her age. Yeah. Because how old is she at this point? At this point, I would say she's 27, that's 26. how old I am. Now, I will grant you, you are married. Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> <laughs> how long have, <laughs> have you been with um, Cody, our, our little ice monster? Our little... Our little Classic Grimly. <laughs> um, I've been with Cody for a decade. That is, and that to a me, very long time. It's a very long time. And sure. I, and I love my husband. And one of the things I love about him most is the fact that he is, in fact, the same age as me. Mm. And I think that there's a that'll help. I do think it it would be really difficult to go from the age of 22 to 27. With someone who wasn't also 22 to 27. There's a lot of growing that happens. There's a lot of growing that happens. And I mean, we just see so much in this episode. Um, I feel like the unspoken thing is like the loneliness Ugh. of Holly. I mean. How lonely she is in her, in her youth. But also with one foot in youth and the other foot in, in a completely other generation. She's she's acting as sort of like companion nurse maid. Yes, nurse maid, nurse yes. Nurse maid, companion nurse maid, but still being like young and vivacious. I feel like, so there's a monkey in this episode. There's Coco, which not the famous Coco. Not the one, not the problematic one. 
Oh my god. Coco the spider monkey. Not the gorilla. Not the gorilla. Smaller. Smaller, longer arms. Graceful, long arms. And Coco the spider monkey um, lives, of course, in the Playboy Mansion Zoo. And we're introduced to her as having recently lost her brother. Luckily, I have another love in my life, and her name is Coco. She is a spider monkey, and she's sad because her brother died. Coco, come visit me, baby. Oh, I'm gonna go get some grapes, and then you'll come visit me. I kind of think of myself as Coco's mom. She's my baby girl. Oh, Coco, don't eat and run. Coco is somebody who brings a lot of joy to a lot of people, and I just want her to have a lot of human interaction so she never feels alone. It's really like, when you really dissect this episode, it's very much like a, it, it is a devastating episode. It's really haunting. It's a haunting episode. It feels very, it's bleak. It's Charles Dickens could never. Because, okay, okay. We're really, okay, we're cooking okay, with gas yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So it's a five year anniversary, which they really are hammering home that this is like a marker in I, Holly's life. They don't sit, so, not in halves. Yeah, but because that's what I was thinking. I was like, how long is this? relationship compared to the other girls that he's had. Well, and so here's the funny thing is that in the episode, Holly says like, oh, I have five years under my belt. That's more than some people can say. But like in the research that I have done, I know that that is not really true. Like of the women that were her contemporaries, the early 2000s girlfriends, like, yes, that is true because they- they were there for like one to two years, two to three years, max. So she is the most of her contemporaries, but this is a man in his eighties who has several 10 year relationships. Like what, like he's been married before, I assume. He was married twice. Okay. Um, the more recent marriage that was, I believe 10 years, he had two kids from it. Um, they separated like in 98, and that was when he started taking on like the seven girlfriends at a time. Got it. But then his first wife had two kids with her. That was back like in the 50s. When he started a disgusting, a disgusting time period. Ew, I don't like it. (laughs) But then he also had all these other girlfriends in between that were still like five, five, years ish like that's like his sweet spot i think of like five 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 to ten years now your wives are ten girlfriend main girlfriends are like five so you're a scholar of of this sure how long does holly last after this so at this point i think she she's got like two more years left okay i wonder i mean she's so interesting she's genuinely so fascinating she's the most fascinating out of all of them without a doubt i do think like even even if she's not trying Mm -hmm. to have this demeanor she is the main character yes and i think bridget is like yes of course you're the main character yes kendra would like to be but we all collectively know like okay the the interesting thing this you're really touching on something here at the time and some people, people would still say this today that like Kendra was the reason the show was a success and that she was the big draw. And like, yes, but she is very much not the main character. No, she's like the ingenue, mm-hmm. but like Holly is the diva. She, yes, it is. It feels very like. I don't know, like what's a musical that would be comparable to this? Where she, I feel like Oklahoma or yes. something. No, like I, she's Ado Annie. Yes. I, like like she's like, um, 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 I guess no. Cause that's like, I was thinking Phantom of the Opera. Cause you know, it's all, it all leads, all roads lead all back roads to lead Phantom of the Opera. opera. Uh, she, it's just like a very, I feel like it's a very classic, like two-hander musical vibes of the younger woman the younger woman who is 
vivacious and she is the slutty. Now, when I was in high school, whatever Kendra would be playing would be the part that I would go out for. Right. Like right. the sassy character. Yes. Fun, sweet, bratty. Brat. I love a brat. We love a brat. We love a brat. We love a brat. We live for a brat. We live for a brat. And then Holly is. Okay, so, okay, wait, wait. I just had a thought. Okay. So in, in like the sort of the, the scholarism of storytelling. Yes. Oftentimes there is the maid, the matron, and the crone. Yes. And I think like you can, I mean, it's not as exact, but like the maid is clearly Kendra. The matron is Holly. The crone is Bridget. <sighs> Maddie <laughs> fucking Turner. You're completely right. And I do think that's why it works. Yes. And although I do think it could, I mean, it's not, sus- what is sustainable? Nothing is. Death and taxes. That's sustainable. Exactly. But I think the reason why it worked even in the concentrated space that it was is because they each had their very specific roles that they were okay with. And the funny thing is, is that they had their pop culture roles that were more like the Spice Girls of just like the very, um, I'm the sporty one, I'm the sweet one. Yeah. Whatever. But really, if we're going back to true storytelling. Greek mythology. Greek mythology. Made matron crone. That's what we're working with. And I do think that... If you added anyone else into the equation, because they do eventually, right? Um, so in the sixth season, yes, the main our core three, yes, leave the mansion. They bring in a new core three, but then we still we still have ties to Kendra, Bridget, and Holly, but they are not living in the mansion. And then there's mm. three new people living in the mansion, oh. and they're the stars. Um, so we see much less of. Our original three. That is fascinating. So they all collectively decide to leave? Okay, so this is what happened. Okay. <laughs> Bridget, the, the quick cliff notes is Bridget leaves because she gets a TV show. She's going to be on Bridget's Sexiest Beaches. Kendra also gets her own show. I remember this. I remember Kendra's show. And Kendra's show was, was like the biggest one. It ran for the longest. And then, so the two of them are like, we're done. And Holly's kind of like crisis of consciousness is that, isn't this what I always wanted to be the only girlfriend? And then then she got it and she said, adduces. I do not want to be alone with this person. And then she moves out because she, so the sixth season was supposed to be Holly and half all alone. Like a, like a, like a Nick and Jessica. Exactly. That was married life. It was going to be like Holly working at the um, Playboy offices, like doing the photo editing and living with Hef one on one, and like them living in marital bliss. Marital bliss. Right. Of course. But then she just like realizes I can't be alone with this person. I love. I mean, listen, Holly's so fascinating. She's the most. And the fact that she cannot operate in the situation that she's in without the other two, even though you can tell, especially in this episode. Oh, yeah. She is truly like, she's saying without saying every single time, I wish it was just the two of us, me and half. But when she gets that, she only, not that she only wants what she can't have, but it's like, it's deeper than that. I think it's really about like, when you're unhappy, instead of being honest with yourself about like why you're unhappy. Right. And the most obvious thing would be, oh, I'm unhappy because I'm 25 and my- My lover. My lover, my partner, my liver is, is I'm not just an old man because that's not exactly what it is. He's a public figure. He's a womanizer, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. He doesn't, I'm, I don't know. I think it's actually like, there could be something really- Um, there might be something nice about being with someone who is not entirely into you. Yes. Like the idea of being like, anytime there's any sort of really distinct conflict, 
Mm -hmm. It's that immediate like, oh, well, there. it's because of this. It's because of this. It's blaming every other thing on your unhappiness instead of realizing I got to like actually just change everything about where I, I am. I actually hate myself and have always hated myself. And I'm going to need a lot of therapy to not do that. And nothing in my immediate vicinity. All these things I've worked for. Mm -hmm. It does feel like there is like an escapism to the idea of the girls next door. Yes. And I think that's what they're like. Like, I think the idea of being like so hot. That, like, an old man would just, like, pay for me to live with Mm. him and, like, do nothing but be hot and, like, live with him. But that's actually really miserable. Like, even if you go on vacation, it's still you on vacation. (laughs) Wherever you go, there you are. Exactly. Even 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 to the Playboy Mansion. Mansion. Well, and the thing is, too, is I think it's like, oh, look at these things that could I could potentially have like you're still with an old man who's not even going to be able to keep up with you yeah and enjoy these things in the way that you want to enjoy them and now I would actually say there are probably some older men or old men who maybe like keep a woman absolutely or someone who's like just not interested in a a younger lifestyle and and I think it can totally work it can total. I think it can work, but with Hef specifically, it's like I'm going to promise you this um, beautiful lifestyle, and then when you're actually in it, you there's know, dog shit on the carpet. There's dog shit on the carpet, and you actually don't go on vacation. No, and it's like okay, so we talked about this before, but I think there is something so interesting about how, like there. Holly is like a metaphor. Mm -hmm. She truly, like everything she does is so symbolic. Like the fish in the aquarium. What's up, Holly? Bob Morris is our fish man, and I wanted to get Hef for our anniversary some new fish to add to the aquarium in the aviary because he's always complaining that the fish aren't colorful enough. I know I definitely want a Nemo and Dory. He has to have his friend Dory. Like, come on. Oh my God. The the monkey in the cage. Marie Antoinette. Marie Antoinette. Melted cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I think there, I mean, like the fact that she felt so much kinship to this lonely spider this monkey. Monk. In a cage. In a cage. It, it writes itself. Okay, I wonder. And I feel like I already know the answer, but like, I really just want to be transported to this place in time and to just like watch it. I remember watching the show and like, I was not picking up on these themes at all. But had I been an adult watching it, I wonder what it was like for the producers to be like sitting there and being like, damn it, man, we really fucking did it. Like, she is in the cage. Do you think, okay, hear me out. Do you think, because like I, in my mind, like I don't want to think that they knew that. I, I want to think that it was like, it's so accidental. Yeah. But like in order to have like a fully grounded understanding of that, like is there a reality show right now? Ooh that we're looking at that we're not seeing the symbolism like the bachelor the bachelor i mean that's so it's so curated and it's so like become a product of its time i think and the kardashians own their they, narrative so much it's so different than what like there's no real producers involved in the kardashians they're the producers they're the pro- i think you know i think it would have to be a really small show. Yeah. Because the the stuff that I watch is like the Real Housewives. Right. And they, at this point, it's been on for so long. They know what they're doing. They know when they have a moment like, like Holly with the monkey in the cage and being like, I just want to take care of something and I for something want, to love me unconditionally. I want anything to love me. Anything to love me. Literally anything. <laughs> even if it's a fucking monkey. Or a fish. And like <laughs> her putting her finger up to the fish tank and being like, And it's the fish like following, following it. her. And she's like, it's like a baby. 
I think on some level they saw it, but I think it was a time in reality show history where people didn't exactly know what what the audience was aware of. Right. What, um, how in depth and emotional and symbolic they could get with things that I, I think they knew on some level what they were getting at, but it yeah. wasn't fully realized. Where like now, when you watch The Real Housewives, you're like, they know exactly like they know the, the narrative they, they know what they're doing they know what they're Whereas, doing like reality tv was so in its infancy at that time very and if much this is like 2007 this is like the the peak of like the writer's strike yes where reality tv got its legs is because and we, she learned to run and she ran so oh, far. far like that's the value in reality tv mm-hmm. where it it is so unaware of itself, potentially aware. We don't know. I, I, I think it's aware a little. A little bit. But there like, are people in the mix who are aware. Yeah. But everyone is not in on it. No. The audience is fully not in on it. The, the producers are not fully in on it. Even Holly isn't. Isn't. In. Is not in on it. And the, she says things sometimes where it's like, wow, like n- no one could have scripted that for you. Yeah. There, it's not possible. It's not. Holly has like her, her interesting moments. Now, I never really feel like, oh, that was so scripted unless it's just like a real, we're just trying to get to point A to yeah. point B. Yeah. Kendra. On the other, other hand. hand. <laughs> sweet, sweet Kendra. I mean, there is something so, like, wonder... Like, I, Kendra would not... We're in an alleyway. We're recording this sitting in an alley. We're literally in a dumpster right now. <laughs> it's so chic. I don't think she's stupid. That's not what it is. No. I just don't think she's very articulate. Like, I don't mm-hmm. think she knows how to... Con- she doesn't... She feels a lot of things. She thinks a lot of things. She does not know how to translate that into spoken word. Yes. Does not mean that she's stupid by any means. But the way that she speaks sometimes, the things that she says sometimes, you're like, wow, that... Not a lot of thought. Not a lot of thought. I mean, she is so young in this. And somehow looks so old. So old. Like How? I think it really comes down to, and I have... <laughs> I've discussed this ad nauseum. It really just is the bleach blonde hair. It yeah. ages you in a way. Like, I just want to... It's that specific type of bleach. Yes. I do wonder what hairstyle is is that, like, for the 2010s. Like, I Ooh. wonder... Cause, because that's a very early to mid-2000s, and I think there's something so specific. I wonder if yeah. it's going to be, like, the chunky... Like, I would say big, it's chunky. The chunky big, highlights. The big barrel curls. I think it's like, I mean, I I would say off the top of my head, it would be the chunky highlights because I do remember being in college in the 2010s and like a lot of girls with it's like chunky ass highlights. But like ash blonde. It went from bleach blonde to ash blonde. Yeah. Because that's the signifier. That's the signifier because 2010s, there were no, there was no one with the bleach Marilyn blonde white hair. No. No, 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 no. We had learned we had learned about purple shampoo. Oh, honey, you guys, you gotta get some purple shampoo. Those all I can think about is, I wish they had some purple shampoo. I wish those girls had some shimmer lights. Ooh, I think that's what it's called. I think you're right. I think that's the name of the shampoo. You know what they're doing? They're like washing their hair with like the blonde shampoo. Oh yeah. And they're not injecting a little purple. Like the to... Paul Mitchell. Yes. Oh my god, honey. The hold Paul Mitchell had on women in the early to mid two thousands. Okay, you give me some Paul Mitchell redheaded shampoo. Ugh. I am instantly transported to the <laughs> dorms of UNH, where I attended band camp. Yes. And I am just washing my hair with the color depositing Paul Mitchell red You're shampoo. Right. Am I Sarah Ferguson? Yes. 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 That's I, the only redhead I know in popular culture. I mean, I was saying Lindsay Lohan. Oh, right. 
That was a big one. Right. Her, but she had like blonde hair at that time. She did, yes. 2010s, she was very blonde. This is such contemporary news, but have you seen the stills from her Christmas movie? Was I born yesterday? <laughs> Is it you that shared them on Instagram? I did. Okay, then that's probably Also, I could have been born yesterday. They came out today. (laughs) Was I born yesterday? Yes. Yes. And I still have found them. And I still, because I know how to fucking use Google. Aki? Um, I'm excited for it. I can't wait. I... (laughs) Watching... Oh, I almost fell. Um, Watching this episode made me think about... Like, so there's this moment where Holly talks about how she's like, yeah, there were a lot of other girls in the house. (sighs) There were a lot of other girls in the house when I stepped in and now there's only two. And I was thinking about how that would make a really great murder mystery. (gasps) Ooh. Like an Agatha Christie going into a Playboy mansion. Oh, I love that. Yeah. (laughs) I'll write it. But I think that's like, that's a really, like when, the way that she said it was so insidious. Like she could have murdered those girls in she, cold blood and I it would have had the same read. The The funny thing is like in her book, I first first let me say I'm a Holly apologist. Oh, a Hollygist? I'm a Hollygist. <laughs> and uh, in her book though, she's very much like the victim. Right. And like the victim of the mean girls. Right. But, (laughs) but then in the other accounts, like there's another, there's another book that came out before Holly's that was of one of the girls that like was the last, one of the last girls who got kicked out before it was just the, the core three. Right. And she was like, they were schemer, her, Holly and Bridget were schemers. They like wanted to get us out, blah, 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 blah. Now, listen, do I think the truth lies somewhere in the middle? Sure. Sure. But when you watch the show and she has a moment like that, you're like, yeah. Yeah, no, you you, you definitely schemed. You schemed. You schemed. You're a mean, mean. (laughs) Listen, do I think there's a mean girl in all of us? Yes. Yes. Of course. Of course. Anyone who thinks they're above being a mean girl is a mean girl. Yes. It is the easiest thing in the world to unlock that inner cruelty. That's our job as human beings to not indulge that. Exactly. So I totally believe Holly, especially with a little um, minion slash crone like Bridget, Mm -hmm. who is such a beta. Like we love a beta, but we love it. She's she's, a beta. She's a beta and she knows that and she owns it and she works it. She has never she works once, it to her advantage. She's never once thought that she's the alpha. And I really love that about her. Me too. I think that's what makes her so successful is because she is unapologetically a beta bitch. So in the DVD extras. Right. Of course. <laughs> of the first season, they have these screen tests with all three of them separately. And they talk to Bridget. And they're like, do you ever get jealous? Which is like a big question that they always ask the other girls. Do you get jealous? And I know in the core of my soul, they are never jealous because they do not want to be where Holly is. And Bridget, when they ask her that, Bridget is like, no, I mean, I just like, I have like crafts and hobbies. (laughs) (laughs) Like, I don't have to like give this old man a five-year anniversary gift. And I don't have to like be in bed with him and watch old movies while he like gums some clam chowder. Yeah, no, like I get to just live in this cute little house and have all my fun hotness paid for. I enjoy myself quietly. I come in when necessary. Like I clock in, clock out. Yeah. And I'm not She's, she's like, like, she's like, she's not, she's not, um, you know, she's not the PIC. She's not. And she is totally fine with that. And so and was Kendra. Her, and that's why her and Holly. Well, I think Kendra thinks she wants what Holly has. I think so too. But yeah. Kendra doesn't actually want what Holly has. Kendra just wants sort of that. Kendra wants to be the star. Yeah. But she would never put in the work. No. That Holly put in. And Holly knows that. 
And that I, I think that's why Holly was never actually like threatened by her. Yeah. The episode we watched last time where Holly gave her the costume that she like wouldn't wear. Yes. Everyone was like dressed up in these gorgeous costumes and Kendra looks like such a dumbass. She's wearing like a ponytail and everyone is in like full Rococo, like <laughs> 17th century garb. Or I guess it's 18th century garb. You fucking idiot. <laughs> I'm so dumb. I'm so sorry. I do think that there is an element of the way that you'd be annoyed at like a little sister. Yes. And you'd be like, you can do better than this. You can try a little harder. Yeah, you can, but not like an actual rival. She brought her the costume because she knew that it would be 20 minutes before and Kendra would be running around like, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't know what I to do. I don't have anything to wear. So I guess I like, won't come. I just and won't. she'd like make it about her. Mm-hmm. And Holly didn't want that. Holly, at the end of the day, would be a great sister wife. I mean, she really, she truly is like a sister wife. She is a classic sister wife. But I do think like she could operate well in that system. Because she does. Okay. So have you ever watched the show Sister Wives? Oh yeah. Oh God. There's no Robin, you know? There's no Robin. Ro- there's no Robin. And that's why it works. Mm-hmm. Because, okay. So did you hear the news? One of the sister wives, Christine, she she's leaving. She's left. She's <gasps> gone. Which which one is she in like the marriage order? So, okay. So okay. the reason why I brought this up and okay. I love this, um, <laughs> I, I love this term. <laughs> so Christine was the third wife. So there's Mary, Janelle, Christine, and then Robin. Robin. And there's, you know, a pretty big gap between Christine, Christine and, and Robin. Robin. Christine called herself the basement wife, which in in the culture right. is like a thing where you are the wife who's relegated, to, literally relegated to the basement. She was not relegated to the basement, but like that is the, you're the basement wife. Yeah. There, there's the, the gals who get the master bedroom. There's the gals who get the, the, you know, the upstairs bedroom <laughs> and then the attic, a, the attic. <laughs> And then there's the basement wife. And she's like, I'm the basement wife. But yeah, you bring in a Robin and she trumps everybody. And I don't think Holly, Holly's not a Robin. No, she's a Mary. She is a Mary. She's not a Jeanette. Jeanette's Jeanette's a Bridget and Kendra's the basement wife. Kent. Or do you think differently? I think Bridget is the basement wife. Ooh. I always thought Jeanette was like, so she was chill. She just like didn't care. Okay, yeah. Janelle. So Christine, Christine was the basement wife, but Christine oh. cared. Right, 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 right. I think that Bridget is the Christine. <laughs> no, actually, Kendra's the Kendra, Chris, Chris, uh, Kendra's Kendra's is the, the Christine. Christine, and Bridget is the Janelle. That because is Janelle was always it's like. like ah. nah. You're totally she right. She didn't care. care. She, she, didn't, was, she was there. She was there. She was along for the ride. Along. She probably was like some sort of closet lesbian. And she I was think like, she I just want to hang out with a bunch of girls and ha- run my family. I, I want to have my family, not have to like deal with some no. guy's sexual whims all the time. No. She's like, I don't care. I don't give a shit. That That is okay. So Bridget is the Janelle and then Kendra, you think is the Janelle. You think she doesn't care. But she does. But she does. She doesn't want to be the basement wife. I don't think she cares, like, about Hugh, per se. No, she does not. But she does care about, like, what it means within the hierarchy of the home. And I don't know if she is an alpha girl. I think she's an alpha. Big alpha. Yeah, and I think her and Holly... I think if Holly was younger, it would be more of an issue. You're very, very right. And anyone would think that Holly is the Robin. No. And I think Holly would think that she was the Robin, but she is. The thing is, Robin, I love what a crossover this is. I know. Because it truly is a reality TV show. I I love when sort of different fundamentals can intersect. This show does feel a little bit culty at times. Oh. 
when oh, you yeah. when you're like a, a big fan of like fundy, um, you know, just cults. I love a cult. I love a cult. Honey, I love a cult. Um, watching this show does make you feel a little like they should be having long braided hair. <laughs> They are like in uniform in a way that they like are. you know they're in their barrel curls and they all have the same hair and, and like they're a, in their juicy track suits. And when they go to at the beginning of the episode they go to the radio station and they yes. are all wearing white sweatshirts. Oh my god, you're Zip right. Hoodies. Look. Also, we 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 must talk about We have to talk about the radio station. The they did Dr. Drew's love line. Ugh, a this, relic. This whole episode is really like, there are so many timestamps of where we are in history. Sprinkles cupcakes. Sprinkles. Sprinkles cupcakes are this Los Angeles phenomenon. Everyone raves about how good they are. And I thought it might be kind of fun for their anniversary to surprise them and have Sprinkles cupcakes. Have you heard of these? It's such a thing. Yeah, I heard of them. <laughs> um, Dr. Drew. Dr. Drew. Finding Nemo. What's the um, name of the restaurant? The Melting Pot. The Melting Pot. Yeah, tonight is a very big night. Tonight is the anniversary for Mr. Hefner and Holly, and we're gonna be doing a big fondue dinner. We're taking the entire living room and we're turning it into the Melting Pot. And it happens to be Holly's favorite restaurant. The That's Melting hard. Pot sign. Yay! Cool. All right. I talked to the chefs and they actually went to the restaurant, got the actual pots, got the actual recipes and ingredients. It's definitely easier to bring the restaurant here rather than try and convince Hef to drive an hour and a half to go to dinner somewhere. As I told you off mic, the melting pot for me was like a big, yes, a big part of my culture. Right. I made my parents take me there like right before I went to college right. because it was a special restaurant. It was just like a hair above the Cheesecake Factory. What is the melting pot for now? Is it Nobu? Is it Sugarfish? <laughs> you know, I think the melting pot is... Okay, so they say in the episode... So in the episode, Holly's favorite restaurant is the melting pot. They bring the melting pot to the mansion. Yes. Because the closest melting pot is like an hour away outside of LA. Like yeah. it's in the more suburbs it's of... Like Anaheim. It's like Anaheim or something. Ew. Ew. Anaheim is so gross. <laughs> it's next to medieval times. Ugh. And Disneyland. Ew. Ew. Gross. But so it's very much like not a hit place. Like it's, you can't go to it in LA proper. No. And me in New Hampshire, I was like, I'm going to travel to Burlington um, Massachusetts, 45 minutes away to mm -hmm. go, like, and Burlington was, like, fancy. It's where, actually, Amy Poehler is from. And she's the fancy. The woman. fan. She's, <laughs> she's, like, classically, like, I'm, like, so, Massachusetts she trash. She's, like, she's, like, the Audrey Hepburn of, of. our time, I would say. Class. <laughs> elegance. Class. Melting pot. If, if that, like. Burlington. <laughs> If that gives you, like, a real picture of, like, where I'm from, that, yeah. like, Burlington was, like, the big city. <laughs> I'm, it's a miracle you're even alive. Honestly, <laughs> I can't believe I didn't just drive myself off the Tobin Bridge. <laughs> but I made my parents take me there because it was fancy. And they were, I remember them being, like, so annoyed. <laughs> By the whole experience, like, the whole, like, oh, the, the fanfare. The fanfare. And they were, you know, they did it. It was a special, a special occasion. But I, I definitely felt like a, it was like, um, we're going to a fucking fun <laughs> restaurant 45 minutes away. Do you, because Hugh didn't eat any of that. No, because he would never. Because it's not his. It's not his like chicken nuggets and like, I don't know, tuna fish. Is that what he's into? He would eat fried chicken and pork chops was like his main thing. So, I mean, listen. He would eat lobsterous thermidor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, God rest his soul, if he was still alive, I would say, listen, bud, take a uh, chicken wing. Dip it in some hot cheese. Hot cheese. You're going to love it. Hot cheese. Now, okay, I might, 
I'm not a fan do. Fan do? <laughs> oh, I'm not a fan do. <laughs> I'm not a connoisseur of fondue. Mm-hmm. Were they just melting shredded cheese in a pot or was there like a liquid involved? Okay, so um, as I understand it, so okay. when you go to a melting pot. Okay. It's a real That's like, where we're going right after this. Honestly, get in the car. <laughs> we'll finish this in the car. <laughs> so the way I remember it is it's very much like um, like a table service flare where you're like seeing them do it. They're throwing everything in and like front a, of you. Like a, um, oh my God, what is the name of that fucking restaurant? Like a Benihana? Yes. It's like a Benihana. Oh my God. Uh, they're throwing cheese in, but I think they're also throwing in like a milk. Okay. Because I don't think it's just a cheese. Because that feels just on like a, like a functional sort of like chemical level, like not appealing. No, there. It, it's like um, yeah, it's like okay. How do, how does one make a queso? I guess that's I guess that's mostly cheese and like um. And that's really. The question. That's the question. <laughs> Listeners, write in. How do you make a queso? No, milk and cheese. Milk and cheese. I think there's a milk and cheese element. There's a little bit of magic involved. Absolutely. Now, also, you go to the melting pot, and it's not just like, oh, here's your cheese, here's your, here's your cheese appetizer, here's your main course, and here's your chocolate fondue. Right. There's a full menu of options. So it is. Do you want to? a cheddar do you want a swiss a swiss do you want do you want spicy do you want do you want a feta i don't know that they're (laughs) fucking i don't know how feta melts baby i don't know if you're (laughs) dipping shit into a feta okay it's greek it's all greek to me it's all greek to me baby (laughs) it's really like um like a table side like guacamole experience oh where they're like and they're just like throwing shit in there throwing it in and they're like poison someone so easily at a melting pot we're really coming up with some really (laughs) fun um script ideas i think this needs to happen i do think there needs to be a girl's next door murder mystery and i want the agatha christie or like the hercule poirot character to be a sort of maybe it's like greg or david or whatever the fuck his name is who's who's how who's there just Brian. Brian. Oh, Brian. It's a Brian. It's a Brian. And he's got some really cool frosted tips. Uh, Brian, I'm surprised as a man who doesn't have frosted tips, but I guess we were past frosted. No, we were not really past. No, I mean, no, no, no. Because what we were doing in 2007 was like the Jersey Shore spike or like yes. the full skater shag. It was like the helmet hair. Oh, I wish super... Brian had helmet <laughs> hair. Helmet hair. That would be fun. She had a Zac Efron, just like, it, I don't even know what you'd call it. It was sort of just a hair shield. I... Boys didn't know. They weren't allowed to cry yet. So they had to cover they their faces. They just had to cover their faces um, with just a whole lot of bangs. <laughs> so, like, all bangs. All bangs. Like, men were just... Fully bangs. And All bangs. From no like feelings. T- 2007 to 2011. Ah, uh, those were the days. Um, oh my God. What? We're like almost at an hour. Oh my God. We're just like so good at this. We really can just like riff. I, I feel like <laughs> I feel like I'm saying this and then I'm gonna listen back to it and it's <laughs> us just like not even speaking English. <laughs> You're like, what the fuck is wrong, wrong with, with us? these people what is wrong with us um so do you have any any parting thoughts i think i would like to see this done again like we're rebooting a lot of you things. mean just doing the podcast again for the <laughs> fifth time <laughs> i would like this recording to not work out so we, so just, <laughs> so we just keep this is the only way we hang out is um is just having to record this one, one podcast, podcast. <laughs> No, I would like to bring Girls Next Door back. I would like it to be with maybe like an Elon Musk s. Oh, like if he if Elon Musk was like, I'm going to just have three women live with me at all times, which is inevitable. This will happen. Yes. Um, I would like to document that, and it's sort of the 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 version of the opulence of the 2020s mm. is like minimal, like white marble granite. 
Um, I would like to see that. And I would like to see the girls next door, but 2020 Elon Musk. And I would like them to be like, I don't know, like pansexual ASM artists. Um, God, I'm like, it would, it would. (laughs) One of them is like just a robot. I feel like it would also look so much more cult aesthetic. So cult. So cult. Like, I feel like they'd all be in some sort of like potato sack top and like Like a a prairie skirt. Like a Yeezy like a Yeezy prairie skirt. Yes. Like a Skims prairie skirt. Yes, a Skims prairie. It would be like a Kardashian yeah. crossover yes. They're cult involved dish. somehow. They're somewhere in there. I do think like at some point, Travis and Courtney will invite two more women into this. And that oh. is what I'd like to see. They are ripe to be like, we have an open relationship. Yes. He, the stuff that they're like sprinkling with Megan. Yes. I, MGMK. I think they're going to, here's my prediction. Okay. I think we're about to like come into like a swingers culture. A hundred percent. And I think they are going to they're be the ones it. to usher it in. Oh yeah. No, no, no. I think it's going to be like a very, it is going to be like a very chic celeb thing to do. Yes. And like, it will trickle into the mainstream and like, mm-hmm. you know, kind of like a lamer way. Yes, like, of course. You know, no one can swing like celebrities can. Yeah. Because like most people are ugly. I would like to see that reality show. I would too. I want to see the Travis Barker commune. The Travis cult. The girls mosh store. (laughs) But I do think Travis and Courtney would run the cult together. Girls Next Door, as it was, cannot work today because no one would be okay with watching a man and like his concubines. But if it's like a girl boss, like a girl boss, unhinged girl boss energy Mm -hmm. and her like beta tatted little bitch husband. Yes. That's what's going to run the cult. That's what's running the cult. That's engaging. Oh no, this is under the guise of like feminism feminism and sex positivity. And it's like, well, a woman is doing it. So there's There's no no abuse. There's no abuse. This is, what are you not sex positive? We're not exploiting women. No. A girl's doing it. Okay. Girls can't exploit other girls. Gloria Steinem wrote that. <laughs> the, uh, Gloria Gloria said explicitly, there's uh, a special place in hell for women who don't exploit like, other, other women. women. <laughs> R- Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Ginsburg. <laughs> Those are my closing thoughts. I give it 18 months. Honestly, I think we need to like make a call and yeah. Just make sure that we get some sort of producing yeah, credit. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I do think, um, so Travis Barker is the lead singer or the drummer of what band? Blink-182? Yes, that that was, okay. you really showed your age there. <laughs> <laughs> I literally had no clue. I, mean, I know who Tom DeLonge is. He's the, the guitarist, the lead singer. Bassist. Okay. Or maybe he is the guitarist. I think he's the bassist though, because Mark know- Mark Hoppus was the lead the singer. Fuck is that? Wow, <laughs> it's like you didn't walk through a strawberries at the Nashua Mall every day of your life and look at Blink One Eighty Two CDs and like listen to them on the the little kiosk. I didn't. I only listened to Blink One Eighty Two on my iPod Classic. In my day, <laughs> we had to walk ten miles uphill carrying all of our Blink-182 CDs. <laughs> all three of them. How, okay, I have one question Okay, though. How are you so sure of who Tom DeLonge is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Honestly, I had a friend who was super into music and he loved Tom DeLonge, but he didn't give a fuck about Mark or whoever his name is, Matt. Mark Hoppus. No, he. I did not know who Travis Barker was. Travis. Didn't well, care. do you, do you know the story of Travis? No. Well, he was. I mean, th- this will actually like. Oh God, I was about to say this is going to take this conversation into a nosedive, but 
Travis famously got into a horrible plane crash. So he was in a plane with, um, it was himself, DJ AM, um, a few other people. Everyone died except for him and DJ AM. DJ AM, big DJ, early 2000s, dated Nicole Richie. Huh. <laughs> um, but so everyone else died. It was very traumatic. Right. They were incredibly like mangled, burned. Right. DJ Am was a drug addict formerly. And then after like getting into this accident, like, he God. got back into drugs and he was incredibly traumatized. Oh no. He died. It kind of like very directly related to like the pain. Right. 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 Uh, medicating for the pain. So Travis is like the only living survivor. Now, recently when he really like got together with, um, Court. with Kurt, there's like a picture of them and they're like in front of a plane. They're, it's like a private plane. And he's like, only she could get me to do this. And it was like the first time he had been on a plane in a decade. Oh. And it did bring a tear That's to this robot's eyes. Pretty... Listen, I love lust. So do I. Because I, I at this point, I do not know if what they have is love. Mm -hmm. But I do think lust can get you on a plane. Oh, I think lust gets you on a plane more than love L does. Love does not get you on that love, plane. Love, you get on that plane and unwillingly. Yeah. And you resent them. And you fucking hate them and you, you hate make them. them pay for it the entire vacation you lust run. on the other hand you're like you run on oh, that, that plane. plane you say i'm gonna pilot this bitch <laughs> and i do, and and so that's that's what i really love about the trav court um mm. and what and, and i what i think ties in so beautifully to what you were saying in the sort of predating of the swingers cultures mm -hmm. there's a lot that's going to happen because of lust Machine Gun Kelly, Megan Fox. Those two don't know what love is. Hell no. They're they know too what. too rich to know what love is. <laughs> you don't have to love someone when you're rich. You can just fuck your brains out. Literally, that's all you have to do. Can't wait to get rich. Me too. <laughs> Maddie, can you, can you tell everyone where they can find you? No. <laughs> no one will ever we'll find, find me. You'll never get me alive. Um, you can find me on fucking Instagram or TikTok. Turner Madeline or Madeline Turner. You figure out how to spell it, bitch. Wow. <laughs> you tell my listeners. <laughs> well, you guys, thank you so much for listening. Did we fully recap this episode? Like, no. No. <laughs> You watch it, you figure it out. You watch it, you figure it out. You fill in the lines and also just be grateful that this <laughs> ever got on tape. Because it it's was true. It was touch and go. It really was. And you know what? Anyone else would have kicked me out of their home after two hours of um, just uh, clicking buttons and going, <laughs> Can you hear me now? What about now? I'm playing Can you talk? <laughs> I'm playing solitaire. <laughs> All right, um, bye. <laughs> hey.